Okay, we are in Romans chapter 12, and we are learning about conduct now. And he is going through with us very specifically how we are to live and, and uh, uh, outlining for us uh, several different ways of conduct of, of the way we should be acting and responding. And so um, we're going we're gonna to start reading from Romans chapter 12, and we'll, we'll re- overlap with some ground that we covered last week. But read, let's start reading from verse 9. Um, so remember, this is not gifts. This is just direct conduct, direct instruction. Verse 9 of Romans chapter 12. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor. Not lagging behind in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope, persevering in tribulation, devoted to prayer, contributing to the needs of the saints, practicing hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not be haughty in mind, but associate with the lowly. Do not be wise in your own estimation. Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of the Lord. If possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And so we had learned, last time we had we had uh, had the teaching through... Verse 11, so let's pick it up at verse 12. Rejoicing in hope, persevering in tribulation, devoted to prayer. Rejoicing in hope. What we have in the Christian life is we have a hope. We have a hope that in, in the end, Jesus wins in our lives. We see great victory. He has already defeated the enemy. We have an amazing hope. And when I hear the, the, the teachings of atheists, as, as uh, John Lennox talks about, in atheism, you remove all hope. All hope is gone. But what we have in the scriptures is something so much greater. In, 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 Psalm, one, in Psalm 27, verse 13 and 14, Psalm 27, verse 13 and 14, it says, I would have despaired unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. I would have despaired unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord, be strong, let your heart take courage. Yes, wait for the Lord. He, the psalmist says, I would have despaired unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. This verse has encouraged me so much, so many times in my life that I know that in this life, in this life, I will see victory. In this life, I will see it. I would have despaired unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. I will see the goodness of God. I will see that in my life. And that gives us great hope. There's this great hope. And then he goes on, the psalmist says, Wait for the Lord. Be strong. Let your heart take courage. Yes, wait for the Lord. Let your heart take courage. Over and over again, the scriptures encourage us to take courage. The reason it encourages us to take courage is because... We lack courage. It would never waste its time saying be courageous if we were already courageous. And so he tells us to take courage. Where Jesus said, take courage, I have overcome the world. He, he, he implores us to take courage. This is what he does. So back in, uh, in Romans chapter 12, verse, verse 12, it says rejoicing in hope. You are to rejoice in this. Not just talk. Oh, I'm holding on to hope. He says you're to rejoice in hope. You're to be happy about the fact that you have hope. It is rejoicing in hope. This, remember, this is a list of, of, uh, of conduct. These, these are commands for us to obey. The Bible is not a book primarily of do this, do this, do this. It gives us story. It gives us teaching through story. It gives us teaching through example. It gives us encouragement. It does give us instruction. And this is New Testament apostle instruction to us. It says we are to rejoice in hope. So this is not something that we should do if we feel good about doing it. We are commanded to do it. We are commanded to to uh, uh, rejoice in hope. 
Persevering in tribulation. We are to persevere in tribulation. We are commanded to persevere. There are times of tribulation in our lives and we are commanded to persevere in this tribulation. And he talked about tribulation. We had already covered it back in, in Romans chapter 5 where, where was the whole section on, on tribulation. And so you see in Romans chapter 5, just a few pages back, uh, reading from verse 3. And not only this, Romans 5, 3, but we also exult in our tribulation knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance and perseverance proven character and proven character hope and hope does not disappoint. So he says we exalt in verse 3, Romans 5, 3, we exalt, which means we rejoice in our tribulation. That's what we are to do. And, and this, this was an amazing portion that that uh, Pastor Robbie had shared in 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 the uh, um, in the sermon this morning, and and I looked it up. Will Durant. Will Durant is a is a historian, probably among the greatest historians of the 20th century, and he wrote a whole series on on the history of civilization. It's like eight volumes, huge. It's like an encyclopedia, and uh, the history of civilization. And he has he has a a. Uh, 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 one of the chapters is Caesar and Christ, and what he writes of Rome is, is really interesting. So this is a this is a historian, and what he writes about uh, uh, about Rome. He says Rome remained great as long as she had enemies who forced her to unity, vision, and heroism. When she had overcome them all, she flourished for a moment and then began to die. Rome remained great as long as she had enemies. As long as we have enemies, it causes us to walk in this, in this, uh, in, 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 to persevere in tribulation. Without contest, we become weak. We really become weak without contest. You say, when, when is this contest going to end? I guarantee you it will not end while you are here on earth. Maybe it's going to end in heaven, but for right now, it will not end. So it, it's not like, um, you know, this, this struggle that I have in, in, in my life, you are going to have these, most of these struggles will always be with you in one form or another. They will always be with you. And it's not like you overcome something and forever it is gone. Sometimes there is that, but most of the time it is not. Most of the time these struggles remain. We, 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 we learn how to overcome within them. In the midst of them we overcome. He says, persevering in tribulation. Tribulations may subside for a moment, but thankfully they don't go away altogether. Things arise. And and uh, this is good for us. Rome remained strong as long as she had enemies. And uh, uh, this is important in our lives to take hold of. This is what God does. You know, He does not leave us just where we are. He constantly is pulling us. What are the classes that you have taken where you have learned the most? And I guarantee you it's the classes where you were challenged the most are the ones that really taught you the most. The classes where the professor was really nice and didn't want to assign too much and you know let you get away with everything, that's not where you learn. You learn when you are challenged. You learn when people put things before you and it is hard for you. This is how you learn. This is how you grow. So he says, persevering in tribulation. It is commanded that we persevere. So there is not this giving up, there is this commandment to persevere in tribulation. And then he says, devoted to prayer. We are be, to be devoted to prayer. This is not an option anymore. This is not having a gift in prayer. These are all commandments of conduct. We are to be devoted to prayer. There are to be things that we hold on to in prayer and pray about this. Well, you know, I don't have a very good prayer life. None of us has the prayer life that we should have. Every one of us is, walks in shamefacedness regarding our prayer life. Always. It's never sufficient. It is never enough. But God is always calling us to more. But what we have here is we have a, a pattern. We have a pattern we are to be praying. So the first thing that I do when I wake up in the morning is I pray for each one of my family members, and then there's a few friends that I have that I specifically pray for them. And and uh, um, and I just go through this list of people that I specifically pray for. I pray for my wife. I pray for each one of my children. This pattern that I have, that I will lift them up each morning. God's protection, God's blessing, God's working in their life, 
that they grow, that they know the, know God more and more. We are to have a pattern of prayer. It says that we are to be devoted to prayer. There's this whole sense of prayer that he calls us to. You may say, well, I'm not very good at it. Well, get good at it. You get good at it by practicing this. You get in this practice of prayer where you, you set aside a time to pray and, and uh, where you petition God and you cry out to God on behalf of others, on behalf of, of things that you're going through, on behalf of the struggles that you have. You can pray for your career. You can pray for success in this. I often will pray that, that, that God gives me creativity because in my line of work, creativity is, is, is something that, that really, really uh, uh, is fundamental. In, in, if you're a physician, creativity is not fundamental. You cannot walk in and say, I'm going to try something new on you today. I just thought of it last night. Let's give this a try. Maybe it'll work. You can't do that when you're a physician. But what God can do is He can give you great clarity to give you the diagnosis when nobody else can give you, can get the diagnosis. So you pray for that. You pray for something that's according to, to, to what you do. He will do that. We are to be devoted to prayer. This is a devotion. He doesn't just say pray, you are to be devoted to it. This is something that we do. And we need this constant reminder. I need it too. I mean, I'm just ashamed of my prayer life. I really am. I'm ashamed teaching this chapter. As I go through this, I'm humbled by this. Every one of these conducts I'm not very good at, and I have to sit up here and teach this stuff. And uh, uh, so I'm not holding myself up as an example, not at all. I struggle with these things, as do you. This is, this is why we're commanded to do this. If, if, if we were good at all of this, He wouldn't have given us a list of these conducts to walk in. And I'm glad that He challenges us with these things. He says, He says, uh, um, uh, he, in, in verse 13, contributing to the needs of the saints. There are needs that people have. He says we are to contribute to that. When Shireen goes to bed in the evening, she has a list of things that she's going to do in the morning. And on that list are all these people that she's going to do things for. She has people that, that are old, that need food, people that, that uh, uh, just are, are, are sick and need a blessing of, of food. And so she's very good at cooking, so she takes that and she uses it to bless people. Contributing to the needs of the saints. You know, when, when students are going away on, on mission trips and things like that, and they have to raise funds, do you know who they go to first? To me. <laughs> you know, they're the, the, I'm like the only adult with a real job that they know who loves Jesus. And, and uh, so they go right to me. Hey, I'm going on this mission trip. Can I get some help? Or I'm going to go for a year with, with crew and, and do this. And, and could you help me out with some month, monthly support? And so I can't give them large amounts, but I will help them out because I've just got many people I'm doing. It. This is what I am told to do. Contribute to the needs of the saints. And... For those of you going on mission trips, for those of you who are, are going to be doing a year with crew or with Baptist student ministry, go to the people who were your peers, who you went to school with, who are just graduating. And just, you can say, you're going to be graduating in May, you're going to be getting a job. I'm going to need monthly support over the next 12 months. You go to them. And I want you to hear this. People have poured into your life. You are sitting in a gymnasium right now on chairs that you didn't buy. Somebody else did. You say, well, the church bought it. The church has no money. It is people that give the money to the church to buy those chairs. You are sitting in a, in a heated room. You are sitting in a gymnasium. I remember, I remember when they built this, this part of the building. It was an older building and they built this, 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 this floor wasn't even here. And there were people that gave to that so that people could use it in future years. You are going to be called on. Now, there are things that you can give while you're a student. Absolutely there are. There are things that you can give. And if you think, I have nothing to give, you're wrong. You can always give something. You can give $5 to something. You can give $10. That you can always give. You can skip a meal. You can give. But when you graduate, remember, I'm asking other people here to think about when your peers are graduating and go to them. Be the first on the list because they're going to have to start contributing to the needs of the saints when they graduate. 
and you get in your mind that you're going to start contributing regularly to the local church so that in coming years, people will sit on the chairs that you bought, so that people will sit in the rooms that you helped to build, contributing to the needs of the saints. You know, uh, uh, just on, on Friday night, I was invited to the gala because our church has a clinic that started about 10 years ago, and now they've They've really built it out, and, and now it's, it's not in mobile homes anymore like it was in the same way that it was. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a lot more firmed up. And now it's, it's not just a physician. They don't just have physicians. They have, they have uh, dentists now and pharmacists. So a person goes in there. These are people who have nothing. A lot of them refugees, a lot of them. And, and uh, you just go in there. Everything is free. You get the gospel, and you get to see a physician. And you get to see a dentist and they work on teeth and then they give you the prescriptions. You don't have to buy it. Everything is given to you. And people in this church, physicians in this church, and not just this church, churches all around serve there for free. They get zero dollars for serving there. The pharmacists don't get paid anything for working there. The dentists don't get paid anything. But they do this because they are serving in the body of Christ. This is what we do. We take our talents and we serve in the body of Christ. If you are learning to be a physician, that is like the greatest thing you can be for service to others. I mean, it's tremendous to be that. And you get in your mind that you're going to serve in this way. If you want to serve in CASA uh, while you're a student, you can do that. If you can speak Spanish, that's even better. Uh, and uh, uh, but you can serve there. You can minister to people. You can you can you can do other other jobs there while you're in medical school. You learn to serve. You learn to give of yourself. We are instructed to do this. We are instructed to do these sort of things. And so they were raising money for Casa, and uh, um, they were trying to raise four hundred thousand dollars on Friday night for Casa to help to pay for the expenses of the year. And somebody had said for the first three hundred thousand that that person would match it dollar for dollar for $300,000. So so that's the type of money that they have to get. They're not paying salaries except to the director who has just full-time job for them. They're not paying any physician salaries, no dentist salaries, no pharmacist salaries, but it's a lot of equipment and a lot of medication that has to be bought to be able to service these things. We contribute To the needs of the saints, we contribute to our community. The gospel goes forth. I think they said there was something like 78 people received the Lord through CASA last year in in 2021. And just the people come from all over the place to go to that free clinic. It is the only clinic that is absolutely free and open to everyone. And so, so an only clinic in the area like that. So this is what we do. We are to contribute to the needs of the saints. We are to, in verse 13, practicing hospitality. This you can always do. When I was a graduate student, my first year of graduate school, I, I lived in the graduate dormitory, and, and uh, um, I used to have guys into my room. That's all I could do. I had a room, and I used to have some guys on the floor, and, and we used to come into my room, and, and we had some prayer meetings together, and other guys who were Muslim, we weren't praying together, but I'd invite them to the room. And I always had some sort of candy for them, some snacks, boxes of candy. I'd serve them hot chocolate. Whatever I could do, I did. I didn't have to have a house in order to do this. I had a little dorm room, and there was a bed, and, and a chair, and a desk. And that's all I had. And I had a little refrigerator that I had bought, but I could show hospitality, and these guys loved it. And I remember having these discussions with unbelievers in my little dormitory room. Practice hospitality. It's not just when you are grown up and have a family and kids that you start practicing hospitality. When I hear that people open up their homes for Bible studies, for gatherings, it just blesses me so much because we are to practice hospitality. It's not something that we do one time. Well, I was hospitable last year. I had a friend over. No, it is a practice of hospitality. It is something that we do. We practice it. We practice it. It is something you do regularly where you practice hospitality. Many of you have heard my story where, where we would have, we would have lots of college students into our home. They were a mess. And it was really bothering me, and and uh, the house was getting trashed every night. These guys, every, these guys would come in and all the time, and and uh, I was newly married, and I had a little kid, and the place was getting trashed because college students are inherently messy. They they don't mean to be. It's just built within them. They put their feet up on the coffee table with their shoes on, and they don't even think about it. 
because that's how they do it in the dormitory. What's your problem? What does it bother you? And y- you know, there's a couch there, and they they weigh like 250 pounds, and they'll just plop down on the couch, and the legs go because it wasn't made like a dormitory couch where you could put eight guys piling on top of each other. It was just a regular couch, and things break, and and uh, uh, that's what happens when you open up your home. Things break, and it was bothering me. And, and uh, um, the Lord spoke to me through the scriptures as I was praying about this thing. That the, out of Proverbs, where no oxen are, the manger is clean, but much increase comes by the strength of the ox. And God spoke to me through that verse. If you want to keep your manger, your place clean, don't invite them in. But if you want to see the increase of God in their lives, you keep your home open. And we have always had our home open. I said that we will always keep it open for being used for the body of Christ. And, and to this day, we, we, we have to paint a lot. And, and, uh, you know, we, we do a lot of plumbing work. We buy a lot of furniture. Furniture gets, gets replaced often. It's things that we have to do because of that. But we're willing to do that. It is a practice of hospitality. And I'm so blessed that people have seen the way Shireen operates in the home and, and these young women, they get married, they want to do that in their own home. And it's not like this was a revelation to us. Shireen and I had seen our pastor in, 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 when we were, when I was an undergraduate, when I first met Shireen, how he would open up his home for this type of thing. We learned this from people before us. We learned how to practice hospitality. It wasn't like, oh, we learned hospitality. And then you practice it in your own home. We are instructed to do this. This is Christian conduct. And then he says, he says the, the, the next thing that he has us do, um, practicing hospitality, we are to bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Wow. Bless those who persecute you. Let me tell you, if this is, if, if this is theoretical in your life, just wait. It won't always be theoretical. There will be people that persecute you. We are to bless them. And it is frustrating, but we are to bless them. And it turns everything around. This whole thing of prayer, where he says we are to be devoted to prayer, it changes us. So so I was speaking to a guy, he said that in his home was this sign, prayer changes things. And what he came to realize over the years is, prayer changes me. When I pray for my enemy, it changes me more than it does my enemy. It changes me. I start praying for them, and then I stop disliking them. My attitude towards them changes. Prayer changes me. God allows these people in my life to get a hold of my heart. He talks about this in, in 1 Peter 3.9. You see the complement of this. In 1 Peter 3.9, it says, Not returning evil for evil or insult for insult. Well, if he, if he insults me, I'll insult him. Yeah, you want to be like the world? That's what you do. You return insult for insult. If you want to be like the world, you do that. We are obliged to be different. We are obliged to be different than other people. You say, well, well, they, they insulted me. Okay. The Bible says you do not return insult for insult. You just do not do it. Because we are the children of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are God's children. We are called to be different. It's like when my, when my kids were growing up, there's certain things we did not allow them to do. And they said, Dad, all these other kids do it. I said, they're not my kids. You're not my kids. I bet you had that in your home, didn't you? <laughs> you know? And, and uh, uh, you're my children. We live differently. We are called to live differently. And uh, this is the way God has called us to be different. We cannot return evil for evil. We cannot return insult for insult. In 1 Peter 3, 9, not returning evil for evil or insult for insult, but giving a blessing instead. So somebody comes at me and does evil toward me, I am now obliged to give them a blessing. I'm commanded to give them a blessing. I mean, where's the fairness in this? The gospel never calls us to fairness, ever. 
That's a human world construct, fairness. They were not fair to Jesus. And he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. We are to give a blessing, 1 Peter 3, 9. We are to give a blessing when they do evil toward us. We are to give a blessing when they insult us. It is a total opposite of what the world teaches us. We are now, you curse me, I'm obliged now to bless you. I'm now under obligation to bless you. According to the commands that are upon me. The strictures that are upon us are very different than what's upon the world. Very different. The world operates differently than we do. For you were called for the very purpose that you might inherit a blessing. We receive the inheritance of blessing when we walk according to what God has for us. Eternal life in Christ is there. Blessing comes by acts of obedience. Blessing through acts of obedience. We lose out on blessings when we do not walk in obedience to these teachings. We are now obliged to bless people when they do the, when they say and do these things to us. Look in Luke, Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6, Jesus just nails this home in his teaching. Luke chapter 6 verse 27. But I say to you who hear, love your enemies. Remember we talked about love last time? Jesus commands us. This is not an option anymore. Jesus commands us to love our enemies. You know, I, I think of I think of women who came out of abusive relationships with, with a wayward husband. I'm not asking you to do anything. Jesus commands us to do something. Jesus commands you to respond in a certain way. You love your enemies. You love your enemies. It's his command upon you. Not me. It's his command. But I say to you who hear, for those of you who hear, those of you who respond to Jesus, I say to you, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. You mean the person who hates me and means my destruction, I must do upon them an act of good? Yes. Yes. Not me that asked. It's Jesus that commands us. We are to do specific acts of good. In Romans chapter 12, the apostles' teachings are going to get to the same thing. We are to do specific acts of good to our enemies, to those who hate us. Bless those who curse you and pray for those who mistreat you. Specific acts of good. And this is what I tell people. I tell women who've been through abusive relationships and they're dealing with this crazy husband, former husband. I say, what does your husband like? What does he like? I don't know what he likes. Well, what does he like? Does he like certain food? You know he likes a certain type of food? Make him that. And next time you see him, just give it to him. Whoa, that's hard. That is that is just asking too much. Okay? I'm not asking you. The one who's commanding you is the one who gave of himself on the cross for those who had spit in his face. You do good to those who hate you. You do specific acts of good. What does this person at work like that is always making fun of you and bothering you? Do they like a particular types of Starbucks coffee? Get that for them. One young lady, I, she said, these guys at work, I mean, they just have their own little group and they just... I said, what do they like? Oh, I, I don't know. They're always talking about hunting and guns. I said, okay, that's easy. You go to the magazine shop and you get magazines on guns and hunting. Guys love those things. Bring it in and leave it on their desk and leave it a little note. I thought you might like this. She says they got it. They were like so surprised. And they thanked her for that. And their whole attitude toward her began to change. Because she found out what they liked. And guys who hunt love hunting magazines. 
Guys who like to shoot, they love gun magazines. I mean, they, they'll read that more than they'll ever read the Bible. They'll read every word in that thing. And, and uh, uh, they just love it. You know, buy them a pocket knife. If they love to hunt, buy, buy, go to the shop and, and speak to the person. What's a good hunting knife? Buy it for them. And leave it on their desk at Christmas. I thought you might like this. The people who actually make your life rough. You see, we are obliged to do differently. The Bible calls us to do things differently than the world does. It doesn't call us to just endure it. It calls us to bless them in return and to overcome evil with good, to specifically do good acts to those who hate us. This is not easy. What I'm putting before you is not easy. It's not easy for me. There are some people who are just do lots of things to me on the internet. I'm not talking about the occasional comment. I mean, that, I'm talking about people that have like devoted their lives and have nothing else to do. You know, people who just live on the internet, you'll never beat them because they have nothing else to do. And, and they, you know, could be just be a, you know, a kid in high school with lots of time on their hands. You just have to figure out what can I do to bless this person? What can I do to bless them? What can I do for them? This is what the scriptures call us to. You want to walk with Christ? You want to be his bond servant? This is what we are obliged to. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I thank and I praise you for your goodness and kindness toward us. Thank you, Lord God, for the way you just cause us to grow by putting before us things that are utterly impossible in our flesh, utterly impossible. But Lord, when we're devoted to prayer, when we're told to pray for our enemies, it changes us. Thank you, Lord God, that you change us when we pray for them. You change us. You make us more like Jesus to say, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Thank you, Lord, that you call us to overcome evil with specific acts of good. You will not leave us there. This is not theoretical anymore. But, Father, you call us into something that could only be done in our lives through you. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for how good you are to us. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you will not let our lives be free of enemies, lest we become lazy and lethargic in our faith. Thank you, Lord, that we continue to have enemies to whom we must rise up and show the life of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that by the grace of God, you overcome my flesh. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Blessed be your name. You are so good in every way. And you lived a life that was so full of example, where you died for those who were cursing you. You died for your enemies. While we were yet enemies, Christ died for us. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you gave your life for your enemies. Blessed be your name, Lord God. Thank you, Lord, that while I was your enemy, you gave your life for me. Blessed be your name. Amen.